Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. He is currently the president of the Alberta Teachers Association. He has been in that position since 2019, Jason Schilling. Jason, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on to talk about the uh, teachers getting back to school, what they're facing mm-hmm. in this upcoming year, but also some of the important issues that are facing uh, the union when it compares to the current government. So I'm pleased to have you on the show. Well, thanks, Chris, for having me. I'm, I'm more than glad to be here. And it's uh, I look forward to our conversation. I, I do as well. Um, I, I usually try to start off all my interviews the same way, and you're no exception. It's going to be a little bit different. But where'd your sense of duty to serve in the teacher's role come from, Jason? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I have kind of struggled sometimes to answer this one because I've always been this way. If you ask my parents, they'll, they'll be like, yeah, you know, they're not surprised that I, I do this work. Um, I was in students union when I was in school. I was uh, education. Uh, I was the vice president of education undergraduate society when I was in university, which is a position uh, of student locals within the association. I've always been involved with um, the association at the local level as a teacher. My first year teaching i was on the negotiating subcommittee and so i've always just been involved because to me there's always a sense that uh, i gain from the work of the people who who work with the association prior to me becoming to a a teacher and i want to be able to give back to my profession and one of the ways i give back is by uh, doing the work that i do with um, the association what was it about uh, the teaching profession that drew you into it was there a teacher in your background that uh, sort of sparked your interest or was it something else that sort of drew you to the profession of teaching? What's interesting, I, I can pinpoint two teachers in my, you know, well, three or four, well, I can pinpoint a lot of teachers who have really great influence over me, but a couple in particular would be my junior high language arts drama teacher. Uh, I really felt as a, a junior high kid, totally self-conscious. I mean, I was the kid who wore a hoodie and looked down every day because I just didn't want anybody to see me. But she saw me for uh, uh, my capabilities and my potential, and she really drew me out of that shell. And then I got to high school, and I had a really great high school English teacher. Um, her name was Miss Stanley, who eventually actually worked for the association. I still could not call her by her first name um, to that point. And so she was a really big influence as well just uh really um really kind of sort of hard nosed but in a, a loving way like really challenged you and pushed you to do um better at the at, at school and so i was really appreciative of that and then of course i had some really great professors in university that um you know i was a marketing major when i first started university i wasn't even in education and i remember having a prof who i took a drama course and he just pulled me aside and he's like what are you doing like the, this management thing is not you. It doesn't suit you. Like you, you come alive in this course. And so that's how I got into drama education. And that's actually what my undergrad degree is in is I have a bachelor of fine arts and drama and a bachelor of education. And uh, it, that led to teaching English. And so I think back to Ms. Briner in grade seven at uh, Pioneer Middle School in Rocky Mountain House was my junior high language arts uh, drama teacher. And here I, lo and behold, it's what I do too. <laughs> So in 2019, you've, you decided to step up and run for the position of president of the Alberta Mm -hmm. Teachers Association. While I tried to do as much research as I possibly could for that role. And if there was an election, if you ran against anyone, or if you were acclaimed in that position, you made a decision to put your name forward and go into the president's job. Was it an easy decision for you? Was it a stepping stone to something else? Or was it a calling that people across this province, teachers across this province saying, Jason, it's your turn. You need to step up because we think you're the leader that the association needs in this time. Um, that's a great question. And I've, I've been involved on what we call our provincial executive council and that's sort of the, the governorship of the association. It's made up of 19 teachers from across the province, from all the borders around. And I was the district representative for the Southwest. So lived in Lethbridge, represented the teachers down there for eight years. Um, prior to that, I was local president for my uh, local. And uh, then I was vice president of the ATA for a couple of years. And I just got to the point where, you know, it's like, it's the challenge of the work. And 
and I was sort of of the mindset of, of, of stepping up or, or moving on. And I sort of had thought that, you know, if eventually some point down the road, I might want to look at a PhD program and, and that kind of work, but I always wanted to be involved and try to give back in that way. So I just felt in 2019, when I ran that, that was the time for me to do that. And that, uh, I ran against, um, it was a good friend of mine, Mr. Greg Jeffrey. We ran, you know, ran against him and he was the incumbent and we just left it up to the teachers to decide through their, their votes, who would, um, be the next president of the association. And I won the election and, uh, Greg and I have maintained a great friendship and he is an excellent, excellent past president. He just knows sometimes went to give me a call. <laughs> so I'm very appreciative of that. And so here I am. And um, been. Uh, was there an issue that was on your mind that made you want to run? Was there an issue that was pressing for your, the Southwest area uh, teachers in the Southwest? Or was there an issue that you wanted to bring to the forefront as president of the ATA, if you were elected in 2019, when you were running? I really always think that it's important um, when doing this work that we build this future, this vision about where we want to go um, forward in education. And one of my favorite uh, committees that I ever sat on and was lucky enough to chair here at the association is our strategic planning group. And this is sort of the long-term vision of the association. Where do we want to go? What do we want to see for the kids in this province five, 10, 30 years down the road in terms of public education? And so working towards that, sort of vision was really important. I knew that uh, um, when we were going into provincial politics, we were watching provincial politics at the time, um, that we were sort of had governments that were putting forth platforms that were a little bit sort of against that and really wanted to make sure that we can ensure that school is the best that it can be for all of our kids and teachers who are working in those buildings. Now, I, 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 I'm a political observer. I, I, I follow organizations like the ATA. I follow organizations like QP, Unifor, all these different organizations that represent a lot of the men and women who work in this uh, province. But there's some people out there who are probably yelling at their screen right now saying, who, what, what does the president of the ATA actually do? What is, what is their role? Are they just there to make the life of the incumbent government hard and try to get the best for all the teachers and raise their salaries and keep them all safe. But in your words, uh, Jason, what is the role of the president of the ATA? Well, that's a great question. And um, one that sort of, you kind of create a little bit as you're, you're working at this. And it's been a very, diff it's very, very different than my predecessors in terms of the, some of the issues that we've had to deal with, you know, most notably the pandemic. Um, but really at the core of it, the association's job is to promote and advance public education in, in the province. Um, it acts a bit as a safeguard, right, in terms of um, pre-service programs, the standards in the prof for the profession, um, you know, the code of professional conduct, the regulatory functions of that. Um, working with government is one of my jobs in terms of uh, my role. I'm, I'm sort of the main spokesperson for the association. It's, it's part of the president's work to be working with ministers of education, other MLAs who I meet with quite often. Um, and I also, you know, there's an external role, part of that role. You know, with this sort of work that I'm doing with you, uh, lots of interviews that I've been doing, going to different sort of representation things. Plus, there's an internal part of it as well. So I chair certain committees within the association and uh, work with local presidents and district representatives and staff on things that uh, teachers see as a priority that we determine at our um, annual representative assembly as policy. And then it's our job to make that policy happen as best as we can. How has the work been challenging for you in the last few years? We are, while still in COVID, we are seeing a government that is saying, okay, we don't need to, uh, we don't need to uh, quarantine if you're sick. You, you don't need the five days. Uh, you don't need to wear masks in public anymore. Everything's sort of relaxing. Uh, as your role as ATA president, how has your life been hard over the last two years when it came to COVID-19? Because you, you, you got elected in 2019, a year later, pandemic hit. So your role and the role that you were expecting to get into is now completely different than what you probably wanted it to be when you first got elected. But you were there and you faced the challenge. How hard was it for the teachers over the last two years learning this new world that we're in? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think we could probably fill up a couple of hours <laughs> in terms of a response <laughs> for that one. Um, so I'll try to keep it as, as brief as possible. First of all, I think it was, it's been hard on everybody. I always say that I don't think anybody um, hasn't been touched by the, the pandemic, either personally or professionally. And, and um, you know, I'm no different than anybody else. You know, there's been some, some pretty bad days and there's also been some days that have been pretty good and okay. And um, I know that it was, it's been a real challenge for teachers, you know, when we were hearing about the pandemic coming, sorry, a little fly there, um, we heard about the pandemic coming and uh, you're watching the news and you just, you just didn't know what it was. There was a lot of questions and uncertainty about what was this, what did it mean? And I really remember specifically that weekend where um, the, you know, the minister was meeting with the, the chief health, oh, sorry, this is, this fly is there, it's driving me nuts. Um, I just, I don't want to pull a Doug Ford and, and eat this aphid in my uh, in my office while I'm talking to you. Well, at least it's not a B, but I'll get back to the point. Um, so when the chief medical, you know, when they're making that determination where their schools would close and go to emergency online remote teaching, like that weekend was really intense. And there was a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty and um, a piece of advice I got from somebody that really actually just sort of rang true through that, through the rest of the pandemic was take a breath, and lean in. And uh, that's basically what I and uh, my, my colleagues across this province did because the way that they taught kids changed overnight. You know, on a Sunday evening at 5 p.m., they said, that's it, schools are closed now until um, further notice. And everybody had to lean in and change the way that they, they did things. And uh, it was challenging for a lot of people, a lot challenging for parents who all of a sudden had to scramble the next day to try to get, you know, childcare arrangements and all of that stuff made. And so it's been that way, you know, through the pandemic as different curveballs kept coming that just changed sometimes hourly what was going on. And so it was just a matter of um, take your time, lean in, uh, you know, take in the information, sort of think about it instead of trying to be as reactionary as possible, but try to try to think through what is the next steps. But uh, then we, you know, came into some disagreements with government about how to proceed with them, um, um, especially when school came back in the fall of summer, of fall 2020, when we first started reopening schools and bringing children and adults back into the building. In the hindsight's always 50 50. You always look back and you always think to yourself, we could have done better. We could have done this differently. Um, looking back on the two years from your role, what would you wish you would have been able to do a little bit differently to help teachers, help students, help parents overcome the last two years? Because everyone was learning in the exact same way in the exact same time as the teachers were learning. So the the learning curve for teachers of how to do it, for how to do sessions virtually, how to get kids online via Zoom at eight o'clock in the morning is quite hard because usually you put a kid in front of a, uh, a computer, they want to play Minecraft or Halo or whatever popular game is out there right now. What would you have wished you could have done a little bit differently over the last two years in your role and as the ATA? That's a great question. And I, I, I've been asked this question several times before. And I, I said to people, you know, I feel like we're still in it. So to do a sort of a retroactive thing of an, doing some analysis on that is, is still, I feel like we're still in the midst of it. And so it's kind of hard to do that. Um, one of the things I really wish would have happened in March of uh, 2020 when schools moved to that emergency remote online teaching is that school boards and government would have said, you know what, kids, we don't need kids for a week. Let's just let the teachers and parents sort of figure out what what their lives are going like to give them a break because the next day you know you had kids suddenly online and teachers online trying to figure out uh, what was going on people just needed time to figure that out in space to uh, reconcile um, what it meant it was really hard on teachers and kids at that point to say you know um you're not, you're not coming to school tomorrow. You have to stay home. And then when you got to the end of the school year in June, I talked to some of my colleagues who had like, we've got kids graduating and I, I didn't get to say goodbye to them or I didn't get to say goodbye to my students at the end of the year, like I traditionally would. And kids were missing that interaction with one another. It was kind of traumatizing there for a bit. Like people were mourning, they were grieving what was happening and we didn't give them space or time to sort of think about that. And so I think in retrospect, I would have liked to have seen a bit of a bigger gap of time there for 
from when school went offline to when we were going to restart with learning like a week or so to let people just get organized. Same thing in the fall of 2020 when we went back to school for the first time to give teachers and schools time and space to figure out the health protocols that were going to be in place um, to get organized to make sure that they had things in place so that uh, the fear and uncertainty of what it was going to look like coming back in the middle of a pandemic could have been better addressed at that point. And I think that uh, um, we, you know, as we tried as best as we could, we even proposed the idea of delaying the start of the school year by a week to just let people get organized and busy because a lot of them weren't into their schools. They weren't allowed in their schools at that point to get organized. And uh, they were just trying to figure it out, like staggered times, kids are coming in through this door. And it's fair enough if you have a small school in a rural area that you maybe have 40, 50 kids in, like um, like in Milo or Airwood, but you get into Jasper Place down the road here where there's 1,200 kids in that school. That's a lot. I mean, that's more kids in that school than the town I first started teaching in. So more, 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 that. more students than the, the community I used to live in in Foss, Alberta, 50 people. So <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody had a different circumstance, but there, there was often just so much of a, a one approach for everybody. And uh, there was, uh, yeah, it just, you know, how, well, how, always you, met, you just said something that I want to pick up on here for a few seconds. You said that one approach for everyone as the ATA, you have to represent rural and urban teachers, right? And the issues that are facing urban teachers are different than the issues that are facing rural teachers. And I, and I don't know what those particular issues are, but mm -hmm. I know from someone who lived in rural Alberta for almost 10 years, I know that you talk to uh, teachers in rural communities, they say, this is my issues that are facing. And then you come to here in Calgary, where we're recording this, they'll tell you something completely different. How, how challenging is it for your position and the ATA to balance that out? Because you have to look after everyone, but you also have to look after the needs and the challenges of each school, each area, each teacher yeah. that they could be facing in their unique little remote rural area or large urban center. Well, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think a lot of it has to do with the structure of our organization. So we have Provincial Executive Council, which I've been a part of for, for many years. And we talk about teachers in the province as a whole, but each district representative sort of talks about their area and the concerns there. And we try to make policy um, that would capture our, our happy for everybody. And we have our annual representative assembly where 450 teachers from across the province come together to make policy that way. And that, cause we're a policy driven organization, but we're also broken down into locals. And then you have local presidents and district representatives who work with their teachers sort of on a smaller scale, like you're talking about there. And so what you might have as an issue, for instance, when I was teaching in Vulcan, um, might be different than my colleagues who are working in larger schools, such as, um, you know, Centennial and Calgary on the South End. And so that the locals there play a really big part in that uh, work there, along with our staff at the association. When teachers have issues and concerns, they phone in and say, this is the circumstances. And so we try to provide that service and that support for our members, regardless of where they are, because really at the end of the day, we have different circumstances, but it all boils down to uh, needing that support when it comes to working with kids and uh, class size might be an issue, you know, it was never really an issue for me when I was teaching in small in a small rural area, but the complexities of my students in that classroom is very similar to those who are working in urban areas, but they also have large class sizes. But I also had a class of 42 one year, right? So we all we all sort of experience the same things, but we try to, uh, to um, address those needs of everybody as much as we can. While we could talk about the ATA for probably an hour, two hours, three hours, because it seems like your wealth of knowledge on it, I want to turn to the big issues of the day, and that mm -hmm. is kids are getting back into school. This is airing on uh, Friday, September 9th, so we are a week back into this uh, school year, if not a little over a week for some students. In your opinion, and in the ATA's opinion, what is the biggest issue facing uh, this school year this year and the teachers and the kids, in your opinion? Um, well, that's a great question. And yeah, by the time that we get to air date, we probably everybody should be in schools that stagger start should all sort of be worked out. Um, there's several things that I think that we could talk about. 
um, you know, class size and the complexity of our students' needs as they're coming into school, um, especially post pandemic, because we've saw the last couple of years have been a real roller coaster, um, been difficult for students and for teachers and everybody who's working and built the, the school buildings as well. So we know through our own surveying that we've done with our membership through the pandemic that the students' needs are, are really um, sort of compounding because of the, the nature of just the way it's been the last couple of years. Mental health needs of our students is, is is really a concern for teachers moving in as well, uh, into the school year as well. So the needs of our students is really a big, big one. Um, there's a lot of complexities there. So learning needs, um, mental health needs, and uh, other counseling needs as well. Uh, teachers also need support. So class sizes are growing right now, even though the class of the year is just starting, I'm already getting reports from teachers about growing class sizes. So these are issues that um, you know government and school boards need to take a serious look at. And um, really, instead of trying to get sort of band-aid approaches that we see sometimes, such as the government's announcement mid-August about they're going to hire 800 teachers and allow school boards to use the reserves to do that, um, well, that's kind of a bit of a band-aid. We need a more long-term thinking to some of the systematic things that we're seeing within education. And uh, we can't just do band-aids over band-aids over band-aids. Um, so what is the long-term course, solution? Sorry, sorry, I just need to clarify no. that because there's probably someone yelling at the screen saying, are you wanting 1,600 teachers, 2,400 teachers? What's the number you're looking for? That's not a band-aid fix, but a, a long-term fix for the Alberta Teachers Association and to get us back to, and I, I hate to say normal, but get us back into a position where classroom sizes are down and a little bit uh, more of a one-on-one -on -one time with that teacher or support staff yeah. that kids are so desperately needing. Well, really starting to look at our, our largest class sizes in the province and addressing the needs there, splitting classes, making sure that we have supports in there. As we've been talking as well, it's also looking at sort of a comprehensive school approach, making sure that we have the wraparound service and supports that we need for our students. So mental health counseling, um, you know, we have policy here at the association that says every school should have a counselor for every 250 kids. Well, I can tell you coming from a small school in a rural district, you get a counselor once a week and sometimes for only the afternoon. And that's not addressing the needs of students and, and school. And so they act out in, in different ways. Um, it's looking at more teachers in schools. Um, sometimes it's, you know, schools will say, we don't have the room. I'm like, okay, but there's a way that maybe we can sit down and have that conversation to make sure that the funding that's coming in is actually being directed to those classrooms. And so start with the large classes, make sure that we get to, um, you know, I mean, a long-term goal would be a student pupil ratio of some sort, like a class size cap that you see in other jurisdictions like you have in BC and other areas. There has been some talk about the last two years and how kids were taught. Uh, some might have fallen behind because of the virtual learning and they're not in class and they don't get that social aspect, but also it's harder to teach sometimes virtually compared to in person. Um, is that a concern for the ATA that the incoming classes that are going into school right now, and as you said, by the time we're airing this, everyone should be back and uh, mm -hmm. whether that be in person, I'm not sure if there's still, some are still doing virtually or if they've taken them out to homeschool them for a bit until COVID completely dies down. But is there a concern with the AT, from the ATA and yourself and teachers that you're talking to about the uh, level of uh, education that kids got over the last two years due to the pandemic, whether it be uh, physical, social, uh, uh, in, in the literature field, sciences, is there concerns that this year is going to be sort of a weird year where you're going to have to re-educate kids, but also teach them what grade they're in now? Well, that's a that's a great observation because that is you know we off we do a fair amount of surveying of our members. So through the pandemic, we we call them the pulse surveys, but we also do a member opinion survey, and we actually call it within that survey student readiness to learn. And where are our students and are there concerns about that and teachers have identified sort of the exact same stuff that you just had uh, mentioned there so the pandemic has sort of been a bit of a roller coaster you're you're in school you're out of school you're in school you're out of school you're sick you got to isolate teachers have to isolate and so it's been it's been of a roller coaster and it's nobody's fault. 
right? Because we're dealing with a pandemic. And so there are concerns by teachers to, to kind of, and this is one of the things that I, I will push back and some people say, well, there's gaps in learnings and it's so-and-so's fault. And it's, it's not, it's been people been doing the best that they can in the last two years to, to keep up with, with that. But we do need time um, in space in our schools for teachers to do that work with students to to help them catch up on areas that they might have fallen behind on and sometimes I find the approach the government takes in terms of um, trying to catch people up just seems to be a lot of the standardized testing well, let's just test kids see where they have gaps and then we'll test them again in a couple months to see if they cut up and then we're going to test them again at the end of the year um, to see where they are at that point and you know I always would, I would say to um, MLAs you know, give me a couple of weeks in my classroom with my students, I'll be able to tell you where their weaknesses are and where they got, they need to catch up. And then I'll work with them to do that. But uh, when they throw all these other things in, like a lot of assessments that they plan on doing for the K to three, it takes time away from teaching because you're only doing is testing. And so we need to make sure that we give teachers and students that time to learn together and to work together that way. We, we talked about classroom sizes being one of the big issues that are facing kids right now, particularly in urban centers. I, I, won't, I wouldn't say all rural areas are facing this concern, but urban centers for sure. Um, what's the number that would be appropriate for the ATA to go forward? Is it 25 students for uh, one teacher? Is it 20 students for one teacher? Is there a magic number? And I say the magic number because I know it's never just a magic number because all grades are going to be different, whether it be grade one to grade 12, it's always going to be different. But there must be a sweet moment in, in that, that finding that you can say, if we had hypothetically 19 students for every teacher, our, uh, we would believe that our kids would be getting the best education that they would require. Not that they're not getting it now, but they would be getting that more one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers. No, and what we've been using in terms of numbers, and it's this is a debate that we have. Do you have a pupil-teacher ratio? Do you have a class cap? Because, well, my class is 25, boom, no more kids, right? But where do those kids go? And so um, I know in the past that, you know, if I had a class of, I think 42 one time the class got split and then somebody else had to pick up the other the other half of that course. Um, but we do have in our policy uh, some numbers that are based on the Alberta Commission of Learning that happened just after the strike in 2002. There was the Commission on Learning that gave some guideline target numbers. And I would be hard pressed to rattle those numbers off the top of my head for you, Chris, but uh, they sort of have a target number for each class. And, you know, they're smaller in elementary and then they grow a little bit larger as you get up into junior high and high school as well. But I think the target I remember from high school was around 25 or 27 kids, but a lot of our colleagues in uh, high school classes are dealing with numbers in the 30s and the low 40s. The But the number today is not a sustainable number going forward, is it? Like, I, I, I remember, I, I, I grew up in Ontario, so I, I did not go through the education system here in Alberta, but um, my class size in grade 12 was, I think, 43 students who graduated that year. And mm -hmm. our class size for science and like uh, English and math were like 12 to 15 tops because we just didn't have the pot of the numbers to do it. Um, in Alberta, the class sizes of saying high 30s, low 40s, that's mind boggling yeah. to me that a student is not getting the one on one connection that I might have gotten. Well, that's why it's been such an issue um, that we've been pressing with government for and it's been an issue that has been growing over the course of many many years i mean it's not just this current government that we've been pushing class size issues with it was the nds before and the pcs before that um the fix for class size unfortunately for governments is rather expensive. And so that's why you tend to get sort of band-aid approaches to this issue and say, okay, well, we'll, we'll hit certain areas and try to do certain things, but system in system wide, we need a, a different approach to that. So class size numbers, um, and they're important too. I think that, you know, when I've, I taught classes of 42, 
um, in 38, 37, that's a little less one-on-one -on -one time that those kids tend to get with me. I was always fortunate to have an, uh, an education assistant with me, but it's not the case with everybody. And then some semesters, just because it was in a small school, I'd get a class of nine. And uh, that was even, you know, kind of challenging because <laughs> those kids would just look at me and go, there's only nine of us here and they can't escape, but they got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, whether they wanted it or not. And uh, so it's, it's, we try and, you know, it's a, it's a conversation that we need to keep having, but we need to see solutions on it. And unfortunately, one of the things that government sort of stopped doing in the fall of 2019 as well is collecting class size data. So they used to collect from the schools, what are your class sizes and what are we, what are we seeing? Because it was part of that class size funding. Um, so they, they changed the funding formula around with that and then stopped collecting the class size data. Well, you can say, well, class sizes isn't really that much of an issue right now. Well, yeah, because you're not collecting the, the data. But what I hear from my members anecdotally is that we are seeing some large numbers. I, I want to turn to government relations now. And one of the big things is the uh, the current United Conservative uh, Party's leadership race. On August 10th, mm -hmm. the Alberta Teachers Association in Banff held a... Uh, I, I want to say a debate or informal get together with some of the candidates. I think all but one were in attendance from the photo that I saw. Um, was was there anything said during that uh, that discussion with the candidates that the teachers took away and said, "Okay, we feel comfortable with the way that things are going and where these candidates want to go"? <laughs> or, and I, I know I'm setting you up for a, like probably a 20 minute uh, rant, but I'm going to ask this anyway. <laughs> Did you get anything uh, out of, did you get, did the Teachers Association, the Alberta Teachers Association get anything out of that debate that they were not expecting to get when they went in? Um, the, yeah, and I called it a panel because they didn't really get to debate. Yeah, so we invited them in. Um, we had teachers submit questions through our website. Uh, there was um, over 80. So we sort of thematically chunked them into certain areas and uh, um, the leadership candidates were there. And we have been meeting with them um, as well prior to that. So I've had some time with the leadership candidates as well to go over some of the issues and concerns that we had. Um, there's a couple of things that came up that were of interest. So one of the questions that was asked because it was a really big um, theme within the questions that the teachers put forward was the relationship with the association between government because government has been very adversarial towards the association um, and uh, teachers don't they, they have questions about that they don't they don't like that aspect we've been around for over 100 years we've worked with government that entire time but um never in such a level of difficulty as we have with this current government and this current minister so that was a question that was interesting to put forward because pretty much all of the candidates there said yeah this has been bad and one specifically said i don't understand when teachers became our our enemies and uh that is something that uh, you know teachers there sent a strong message um, as they were talking. The, the crowd was very much a vocal as the people were talking. I don't know if you've watched the video, but sometimes they would say things in the crowd there would be like, nope. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think that was a really key part there that came out. Uh, another question that was big, and we haven't really talked about it too much today, um, is the curriculum and what would those- That was my next candidates... subject that we're going to be moving into. Oh, after. okay. <laughs> all right. So well, I'll, I'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But asked about curriculum, and they all sort of gave their opinion of, that was sort of a big spectrum of, no, we're going to stop it. We're not moving forward with it. We're going to go back to the drawing board to, well, we'll kind of keep going a little little bit with what we have so far. I heard, you know, people are okay with math and English, which again, the crowd made their noise. Nope. And uh, that was interesting as well. And then the big one too, at the end was, you know, if you recall in the fall of uh, 2019, they put forward bill 22, which moved the um, investment management from ATRF to AIMCO when it came to teachers' uh, pensions and uh, really was surprised to see some of the candidates up there just point blank say um, that was wrong. We should have consulted. We did that wrong. That was bad. And a couple of them even apologized for it. And that's interesting to me because you were also a member of cabinet at that time when those decisions were being made. So I pointed out to them at the end that uh, 
I, my, my comment to them at the end, after we heard what they had to say based on these questions, was to look at the people in that room. Because to me, the people in that room who are teachers who care about kids, who care about school, who care about public education, this government and this party has failed those people in that room. And uh, I pointed that out to them, that uh, they stood there and they, or they sat there and they told us some words and they told us the used words like trust, collaboration, conversation, openness. And I, you know, I don't take, um, I value honesty. It's one of the things that's one of my core values. I don't take, uh, I'm not a liar. I don't take kindly to people who lie to me. And uh, I said, we will hold you to account to what you said today. If you become premier, we've got this on video and we'll play back your answers to you and see where we go with that because they, they, you know, they're talking to a group of people and, you know, we always could be mindful of, are they just telling us what we want to hear on um, the cynic in me will be there, but also that sort of eternal cautious optimist will be there as well. And hopefully we can make things better for, for kids and teachers across this province. Now, you, you mentioned something, and I want to ask this last question before we move on to the curriculum. Um, while um, you ha hosted the panel for the UCP uh, candidates, you also mentioned in your previous statement that you took to task the former government, the NDP. So those there are people out there who will probably watch this and i'll probably get strongly worded email saying you brought on an ndp shill to talk about the ndp way and how the ndp are perfect and the ucp mm -hmm. are bad and that's all it is right here right now point blank you have issues with the ndp as well as you mentioned it was taken into account during their time yeah. in office as well right Oh, definitely. I was on provincial executive council during the entire time that uh, um, the NDP were in government, and I, I always get the comment too that you're you're shilling for the NDP, which I think is kind of funny because it is my last name, um, but that's not what. What, what we do. We are nonpartisan as an association. We encourage our members across um, the province who are teachers to be involved in the political party that they want. And they are. They, brought, they are broad spectrum as well, just as much as any Albertan is. Um, you know, specifically when, you know, one of the things that uh, we've said to this current government is we like to think of ourselves sometimes as equal irritants when it comes to government. And even when the NDP was looking to put in their K to four curriculum, while they were um, in power. We're trying to, we weren't um, happy with the piloting process that was going to happen with that. We felt that it was not uh, substantial enough to pilot and test uh, this curriculum. And so we really pushed for them to slow that implementation down so that we can get it right, which is ironically the same thing that we're seeing to the UCP government. So um, we, you know, we were with we have our policy that we have as an association and we uh, advocate for that policy and for kids, regardless of government. I don't care what the initials are, the government that are in power. Um, it's the needs of our students and our members that are important. You, you are the king of segues because you have been setting me up for a lot of these segues there, Jason. But I want to turn to this, uh, the curriculum, <laughs> as you said. Um, now, Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm pretty sure the government really doesn't know what's going on with the curriculum right now, because last time I heard they're implementing some of the curriculum, the proposed curriculum, not all of the proposed curriculum, because they're going to go back to the drawing board for, on some of that, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's put this, let's start with the point blank question. What is the position of the ATA on the proposed curriculum as it was released earlier or late 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so when the curriculum came out in a draft form and we got a chance to see it for the first time, um, Provincial Executive Council passed a motion that said we wanted to see a full stop on, on the curriculum, go back to the drawing board and incorporate the voices of teachers. Because you have to think that uh, prior to the UCP coming into power, we had a memorandum of understanding with government that Alberta Education and the Teachers Association would be full partners on curriculum development. So we would work with our members and find members across the province to work with government on curriculum development and different sort of working tables and working groups and different subjects. And you also have to remember too that for decades ahead, of where we are now, our decades in the past, we've only ever really done one subject at a time. 
And over the course of three years is how curriculum has always been a cyclical process. You're always constantly renewing it, but usually one subject at a time because it's overwhelming to do so much at once. Right. And uh, so when you get governments who are like, all of a sudden we're going to do K to 12, that came out of, you know, uh, the PC's inspiring education. We're going to look at all of the curriculum and then we're going to do all of the, the, the K to six curriculum at once. That's a lot to ask people to do at one time. And then this government was going to do the same. So you've seen a slowdown of that. So when we, the, when that curriculum came out in 2021, we passed sort of, we want a moratorium on it. Let's get back to the drawing board, talk to teachers, talk to parents, talk to indigenous groups, talk to uh, Francophone communities where um, their voices were were terribly silent through that process. Talk to two, two us LGBTQ plus communities as well, because they were absent from that draft of the of the curriculum. And, uh, you know, the government said, well, we did consult teachers, but that is not entirely true because they had 100 teachers look at the curriculum in the fall previous to that in 2020, made them sign a non-disclosure agreement that lasted for a year and gave them a day and a half to look at roughly 700 pages of curriculum. So how, um, you know, valid is that, that kind of input that you're getting from people when you don't give them enough time? Oh, and they did it over Zoom as well. So that it was another sort of factor there as well. So we just said, you know, stop, let's go back to the drawing board and um, make sure that we get this right. Teachers don't want a curriculum that's going to go into place that is going to fail a generation of kids. And uh, that's why you saw such a strong reaction from teachers across the province. I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate with you here, Jason, for a second, if you're okay with that, because it seemed like it feels like you seem to be well prepared on this subject. And I want to throw this out there. Isn't this the will of the government? They were elected. They can put it in the uh, proposed curriculum as they see fit. Um, if you were to say Cole's note version, the biggest issue with this curriculum is blank. What would that blank be for you to say, you need to stop it. You can't do this the way it is, because while we understand that you are the government of the time, we need to go back to the drawing board because this blank is an issue that we need to fix now before tomorrow, before we implement it. Biggest flag that teachers um, indicated through our analysis was age and grade appropriate. So that is, you know, if I had to fill in that blank and say, we need to put a moratorium on it because the, the curriculum is not age or grade appropriate. Full stop. That's the first thing that I would say. Um, an example of that would be the new math curriculum pulls down concepts from junior high into elementary school. So a concept that traditionally might have been taught in grade seven suddenly is being taught in grade five. Well, if you don't have the prerequisite knowledge in grade four to learn that concept in grade five, then how are you going to be successful with that? Um, and that was a, a really big flag that a lot of teachers uh, raised. When you get into you know, age appropriate, some of the content that was in the social studies draft proposal curriculum was, was wildly inappropriate. And um, you know, there's no reason for kids to be learning about the Silk Road in grade two. They're supposed to be learning about their community. That's what the current curriculum is about. You know, this is where I live in Alberta, not learning about um, the history of the Greeks and the Romans at that point. They're just trying to figure out, you know, where they live within the province. And uh, so that age grade appropriateness was a huge flag for teachers across the province and parents and academics and community groups. And you're absolutely right. The government holds the legislative pen and they can write it into law. And then once it becomes law, that's what it is. So what's the silver, what's the silver, silver bullet? Sorry, pardon my friend, sorry, pardon my tongue there. But how do we fix it? Um, you have you had your panel with the UCP leadership candidates. Some said yes, we'll pause it. Some said we'll pause some portions and not others. W what what do we do moving forward? Because we are in the school year now. Some of these yeah. uh, curriculums are being introduced and being taught to students as we speak. Literally, as of airing, some of these new curriculum changes are being put into place. How do we, what do we fix? How do we fix it, Jason? T t talk to the people of Alberta and tell them what's the steps the ATA and Albertans have to take to fix this so our kids are not being left behind. 
we, we pause it. That's that's been our point all along. Is that you, you stop, you go back, and if we do need to move this forward as it is right now, then you make the implementation a pilot project because this curriculum was not piloted properly. You got uh, maybe um, 300 schools that looked at, or 300 teachers that looked at this curriculum um, with a couple thousand kids. That's not a very big pilot. And they only looked at it for five months. So say, okay, optional pilot, if you wanna do this, look at it, let's refine it, and then we'll move forward with that as well but ultimately we could pause it go back redraft get um teacher input into this curriculum teachers can continue on with the curriculum they've been using for the last couple of years and um bring elements in to see if they work or not but uh instead of you know forcing this down onto uh schools and kids there was there was a better way to do this and unfortunately the government chose not to do that Sort of a side question, but relevant to the topic at hand. And then we'll go on to the last subject here, Jason. What's your what's the ATA's relationship like with uh, Minister of Education, Ariane Lagrange? Was it's not good. I mean, I will be very honest about that. It's not. Have you had a sit down uh, with her? Not since um, February of 2021. Even through Zoom, nothing like that? not so we've had a, i've been part of stakeholder meetings around COVID. we were meeting regularly around that but that dried up last year as you saw um, measures would were uh, being removed from classrooms as well um, but to sit down as a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the minister um, that's not happened for a while but i've always been open to meeting with the minister fully understanding that uh, we see things very differently but um, I'm always been willing and open to having the conversation, whether or not those conversations are comfortable. I'm okay with them being uncomfortable and I'm okay with us disagreeing on topics. But I think, um, and this is one of the things that we impressed on the leadership candidates as they're moving forward with this uh, leadership race is that you have to keep the avenues of communication open. Might not like what each other has to say, and that's fine, but you can't just close the door and say, well, we're going to ignore this element just because we don't like what they have to say. Or, you know, if they think that I'm difficult or mean or nasty, I hear all sorts of things, then call me on it. But at least you're keeping that conversation open. I mean, I'm an adult. I can handle, uh, um, I can handle that. I sort of gave up what people thought about me around grade seven. So, yeah. Um, just for transparency's sake for all the listeners right now, we have reached out to the Minister of Education's office to uh, come on the show to talk about the curriculum and talk about the uh, teacher's registry that uh, Jason and I are going to be talking about here soon. Uh, as of September 1st, we have not heard anything back. Uh, if hopefully we'll hear something back by the time of airing this and we'll have the minister on or even a statement about some of the questions we have about this. So just for transparency's sake, we just wanted to put that out there right now. Um, the last uh, topic I want to turn to here, Jason, because we're almost at the hour mark. And I said 45 minutes in the original email, but Holy, we, I know time's it, gone by. That's it, okay. It, this is the way the world works. We, 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 we no. great, great conversations. Just time flies by. I want to talk about the Alberta teachers registry. The, I, I want to make sure I get this right here. The online teachers registry and the teacher and teachers leader registry, which launched on September 1st, for anyone who just heard the last 10 seconds, we are recording this on September 1st. So as of recording this, this has launched. Um, what does this mean for the Alberta Teachers Association? And do, do you have concerns about this now implemented uh, teacher and teacher leader registry? Well, yeah, we have many concerns about it because it was something that was pulled together without um, in-depth consultation with the association, right? So one of the things when I always sit down with people, um, especially with government and, and really anything, and it comes from teaching, is, is just what is the problem we're trying to solve? Like what are you, What's the problem here? Uh, School boards, human resource departments, vet teachers. There's teachers have to have 
a valid teaching certificate in order to be in a school teaching kids. So every teacher who's in the uh, school right now has a valid teaching certificate that's been vetted by a school board. An employer has made sure that they have the credentials to be there. Um, the other thing that is part of the registry is whether or not a teacher has been convicted of unprofessional conduct and had their their teaching certification suspended or cancelled. Um, if you have your membership suspended or cancelled in the association through a discipline process, we publish that information on our website. That stuff is already publicly available. You just have to go look for it. So part of it was, why do we have this? And there was a lot of concerns by teachers in terms of privacy. You know, they, they said, we want to put this information online. But I always find that once you get on a slope, it can become slippery pretty fast. And so now all of a sudden you can start adding other information to this registry that we've not had consultation on or had any input on. And so I had a lot of teachers contact me when this information came out sort of late June. Um, you know, why are they doing this? What's going on? And I, I struggle sometimes to try to justify government's decisions because they weren't mine. <laughs> Right. And so I don't know, you know, people are like, why did, why are they doing this? I'm like, that's a great question. Email them and ask them why they're doing it. And the flies back. And uh, so that's one of our concerns. The other concern that we have as well is that um, there's an exemption process in here as well. So if you don't want your name on the registry for a variety of reasons, and they have a list there, um, you can apply. And there's a lot of loopholes to get through that. So I was talking to a colleague of mine who um, is divorced but their certificates in their married name and they go by their maiden name. So they're struggling to get the government to accept um, their maiden name as opposed to the name that was in their, their original certification. And um, there's no appeal process to that decision. Now, somebody in an office downtown is making a decision about who gets exempted. And we, of course, we're hearing from teachers who've been retired for 20 years who are on this registry list. Um, a colleague, uh, someone who actually just works with me in the building here, we were talking about her mother-in-law was a teacher who's been deceased for 15 years. Her name is on the list, the registry list. And we're just wondering why is that information there? How does that improve transparency for Albertans by including all of these folks who are not active in the classroom on this list? And so um, a lot of questions there. And really the first one that started all of it was, what are you trying to solve and if you had actually sat down with the ATA, we might have been able to, to give some advice and some, some ideas about, about what they were trying to, to have here. But um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And now we have the registry. And so um, we'll just see how I have a feeling that it's going to be a, a bit of um, what? This is wrong. That's wrong. I looked my name up and it's right. And uh, all it says is my name my certificate and um that's it but uh yeah there's good there's a it's just a lot of questions around it so um i want to read part of the press release that came out on tuesday uh august 30th and i want to get your reaction to it because there was a key word in it that i want to know from the ata uh what's different now compared to when the Alberta Teachers Association had their registry. Um, according to the uh, news release uh, dated August 30th, the registry will help increase public confidence in the teaching profession by showing that the vast majority of Alberta teachers are dedicated professionals in good standing. Now, there's two key words I want to take out of that statement that the Alberta government released on August 30th, and the first one is public confidence. Do you believe there was any, uh, the, the uh, majority of Albertans had no confidence in the teacher association prior to this registry launching on September 1st? No. Okay. And I think that there's a lot of, con you know, we, we do polling as well. There's a lot of confidence in the work that the association does. There's a lot of confidence around the regulatory work that we do in terms of um, the disciplinary work that we do with our teachers. We've been doing it for over 86 years. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, there's, it's, it was at that sentence caught my eye too, Chris. <laughs> well, well then you know exactly I, what the next, it, so, <laughs> the next yeah. one that I'm going to ask you, because this is the one that really made me perk up and go, what's going on here? And that is um, showing that the vast majority of Alberta teachers are dedicated professionals in good standing. Um, now, I don't know the day-to-day -day operations of the ATA. We probably could do a full hour just on that. But mm -hmm. um, 
if someone's not in good standing, I'm assuming the ATA is contacting them to say your credentials are out of date, you need to get up to date, you need to do this, this and this. Um, what was your reaction to that statement? Because I was a little perplexed on the fact that there, the Alberta government is saying that there's teachers in this province right now who are not supposed to be teaching because they're not in good standing. Well, one of the things that people need, and I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of people realize this, is that the Alberta government is responsible for certification of teachers in this province, not the Alberta Teachers Association. But you can't work in a public Francophone or Catholic school in the province, unless you're a member of the Alberta Teachers Association. And so if a teacher working in, you know, one of those, you know, public school is charged with unprofessional conduct, we do an investigation, it might go to a hearing, if they're found guilty of unprofessional conduct, there's a, a variety of punishments that that could happen, including suspension of your membership in the association. And often that suspension goes with a recommendation to government to cancel that person's teaching certificate as as well. If you were suspended from the ATA, you cannot work in a public school. In our 100 years of suspending teachers from the ATA, we've never allowed any one of them back. Um, they don't, they're basically, they're gone. We don't, uh, we, we usher them out of the profession and I have no qualms about doing that whatsoever. Um, they can get their certification back. And so that information as government has, has done that sort of discipline process with private school teachers or teachers who are not members of the ATA superintendents. Um, they don't publish the findings of their, uh, discipline in cases and so unlike we do we put it online and you can see where they are but uh, so there's a bit of there's some differences there but um, the government's in charge of certification so if a teacher's not in good standing with the ata well they'll know right away <laughs> right because even if it's not they didn't pay their fees for example if they're on leave that we get a hold of them and say by the way you you have to pay your um your fees while you're on leave and uh, that usually is taken care of and um you uh if you or continue to be a member of not in good standing, you probably get charged with uh, under unprofessional conduct. Um, registration or certification, that's the government's uh, uh, thing and responsibility. So if you're not a good member with them, how they handle that is, uh, is entirely up to them. Uh, last question on this topic, uh, Jason, because I, I want to I want to put the rumors to rest because I heard this over and over again when this registry was first put out via Twitter. And we all know that Twitter is the complete and utter amazing real time of what everyone's thinking at every single moment. But mm -hmm. when this was announced, there were accusations that the ATA is against it because they're trying to hide and they're trying to cover up some of the mishandling of some of the teacher files that were going on. Now, uh, I'll let you respond here for a second, but I want to put, pose this question. Uh, again, Twitter is not the end all be all of what is happening yeah. in the real world. And I will keep on saying that until I'm six feet under. But the Alberta Teachers Association is not trying to hide anything with this, right? What is your, what is your ma major obstacle? Is it just you're making it redundant and you, we've already doing it and you're just doing it again and you're just trying to make it look like yeah. the government's controlling it? So two questions, but one statement in some sense. Were you trying to hide anything? Correct, uh, correct no. everyone for who's listening saying that that's incorrect. And two, what's your major issue? No, that is incorrect. I mean, we're not trying to hide anything. We're just trying to protect teachers as appropriate or required. Um, and that has to do with the privacy aspect of that. You have a duplication of, service, of, of work here that's already being done by school boards in the ATA. Um, but we just want to be mindful and aware of some of the privacy concerns of our members. And, you know, we've got teachers out there who are, is another good example, who might be in, um, you know, domestic situations that are not uh, help, helpful or, or healthy. You know, they might be uh, purposefully not wanting to have a spouse or a partner find them. And this registry could be problematic with that. We want to protect those people. We've nothing to hide. Uh, my last question to you, Jason, and this is uh, on the last note and last question. 
We are heading into the 2023 municipal uh, provincial election next year. Uh, we have the Alberta NDP, the Alberta Party, the Alberta Greens, uh, Alberta Liberals, and the UCP all running to potentially be the next government. What is the ATA looking for uh, from party leaders? What are they looking for from education being a platform? And how does the ATA make education a priority for these parties going into the next election? Well, this is the next hour of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, that's a pretty big question, Chris. Um, no, it's a great We'll have you back because... before the next election. Let's put it that way, Jason. But the cold note version, or or yeah. for those teachers listening, can you give me the Wikipedia version? So that way I can just copy my <laughs> essay off of yeah. Wikipedia and submit it. I always loved those essays when they came in. Um, you know, one of the things I said at our summer conference, and I said it to the, the campaign leadership that was there, is that education should be a top priority every year, not just an election cycle. And that's one of the things that we'll be focusing on as an association is sort of that election coming up in 2023 and making sure that education is a top priority. And we have some campaigns that are coming in. We'll be hosting a, a provincial rally to support and stand up for public education October 22nd in Edmonton. So hope to see you there, Chris. You can you can drive on up and uh, come to the rally. And we want lots of people there to, to show um, candidates and parties across the spectrum that education is an investment in our future, not an expense, but an investment in our kids and our future and the people who work in those buildings. And we need to make sure that education is not only a priority in an election year, but every year afterwards. And uh, that is the work that we'll be undertaking this year, moving into the next year as well, is being focused on the future, what's best for our kids. And uh, that's what I would say to, uh, to parties out there and to, to parents and you know, teachers and even just community members. What are these parties going to do to make education uh, a top priority? Well, Jason, like I said, uh, we could probably, you, and you said, actually, uh, we could probably spend a good hour on this subject, but we are at the hour mark and I don't want to keep you much longer because I know you're a busy man, but I want to thank you so much for doing this, sitting down, chatting about this. Sorry, we went over a little bit over time, but Ooh. it's always great to have this conversation with people. Um, so thank you. No, thank you, Chris. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that you made this time for me. And I, I, um, I will, yeah, obviously, you could tell I love this stuff. And <laughs> I love teaching and I love students. And I love um, my colleagues. And I, you know, that's, I always say to people that uh, you fight for what you value and for what you believe in. And I've always believed in public education. I'm a product of it here in this province. I believe in what my, my, my colleagues are doing. I believe in my students. And so it, it is always um, something I'm willing to fight for and an honor and a privilege of mine to be able to, to talk about it. So thanks. Well, thank you so much, Jason. I want to remind everyone to hit the subscribe button if you're watching this via YouTube or if you're listening to this via audio, hit the subscribe button. And also put down your phone for at least 15 to 20 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep talking. <laughs>